بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode coming to you live from Huda Studios here in Cairo, Egypt it's a privilege for me and an honor to be back on this program after so many years and it's nice to be here again may Allah Azza wa Jal bless this channel and those who are funding it uh, sponsoring it and working in it Ameen uh, our first question for tonight and you will see the numbers inshallah displayed at the bottom of the screens I'm not as good as Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Salah in uh, reading them uh, he's younger than me but inshallah you can do the math Abdurrahman says what if I do not run my fingers through my beard during wudu we know that there are pillars of performing wudu so washing the face washing the arms till the elbows wiping over the head and washing the feet the order of this uh, actions or these actions and the uh, it's to be simultaneous so if I wash my face scholars say your beard is one of two either it is thin meaning that you can see the skin underneath it which is not the case with my beard alhamdulillah so if you can see the skin underneath it then you have to wash it and what's underneath this beard so that you ensure that the water reaches your skin which is apparent but if it's a thick beard what is the ruling different of opinion among scholars some say <coughs> that washing the face includes what you can see from it but what goes underneath a thick beard would be very difficult if not impossible Others say, no, you have to wash it because it was proven authentic that the Prophet, ﷺ, whenever he performed wudu, he would take a handful of water and put it underneath his beard. But this, again, is washing the inside of this side, not the sides here and there, which may lead us to conclude that the most authentic opinion is the opinion of the majority of scholars, that putting water in your hand and putting your fingers throughout your thick beard is not mandatory but it is surely a very highly recommended sunnah that people should not uh, uh, neglect okay we have a caller uh, brother muhammad from egypt Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Akhi Muhammad. Yes, Akhi, what can I do for you? Uh, Sheikh Asim, I know you're not expecting this call, and it was an engineer. This is uh, Muhammad Salah. I'm sitting here in the studio and I'm watching you. And uh, trust me, I'm very, very pleased to see you sitting there where you deserve. May Allah bless you and your family. Amen. And may Allah benefit with you and your knowledge. Amen. And Sheikh Asim, uh, you know, it's such an honor to be blessed by Allah the Almighty to serve the Ummah for so many years, educate them in the, other than Arabic in the English language, answering tons of questions we ask Allah the Almighty to accept from all of us, from you, from myself, and all our colleagues. There is a, a, a very big concern after 16 years presenting uh, on Huda TV, Sheikh Hassan, mm -hmm. which is the concern that Still, a lot of people inquire about, do I have to follow a particular madhab? Mm. Especially people with certain ethnicities coming from a particular background. 
unfortunately given precedence to a madhab over the sound and the authentic sunnah. That is something I'm very certain that you've tackled before repeatedly, as well as myself. I would really love to hear from you so that you can educate me and uh, the viewers likewise in this concern. Also, a word of advice, especially for those who are living in the West Europe and the U.S. and North America in general. Uh, when they hear from here and there, you should be listening to this person and should not be listening to this person, pick and choose, and vouching the credibility of certain people based on uh, particular categorizations, which, which is not really based on is on the right path or not, but to be a specific, uh, to be specifically following a particular group uh, or sect. I would really appreciate if you can uh, take some of your very patient time to tackle this matter or these two matters, please. And once again, thank you so much for um, accepting our invitation here and presenting the program today. May Allah bless you and your family. Amin. Amin. Zakallah khair. Dr. Muhammad Salah, and I have to admit, I was hesitant and reluctant to take your seat, Zakallah Khair. Your contribution to Huda TV is not matched by any of us. MashaAllah, your dedication, your sincerity. That you devoted your time, your effort, and your money for this channel to be ongoing and by far Huda TV is one of the channels that is a beacon of light for every Muslim home it has been like this and it will inshallah continue to be like this with the sincere uh, uh, dedication of Dr. Muhammad Salah and his brothers uh, working in this channel to keep the good work going alhamdulillah as for what my friend and dear brother, Dr. Muhammad Salah, has asked me to comment on, I'm afraid that this might take most of <laughs> the time. And we spoke about this so many times, and those who know me know my approach to it. But because it's a request of a dear brother, I will not hesitate, inshallah, to uh, um, comment in a nutshell. What are you? I'm a Muslim. What kind of a Muslim? I don't see any kind or kinds of Muslims in the Quran, nor in the Sunnah. I'm a Muslim who follows the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the three favorite generations whom the Prophet described والسلام, to say, the best of generation is my generation companions and the generation that follows them tabi'in and the generation that follows them tabi'it tabi'in so you cannot come nowadays and understand the sharia the quran the sunnah with your own intellect it has to be based on the understanding of those who were close to the prophet so any tom dick or harry who claims that gog and magog ya'juj and ma'juj were zombies or werewolves, or Draculas, this is insane. So do I have to follow a particular madhab? Well, this depends. All four schools of thought are great schools of thought. They are followers of great imams of the deen. Imam Abu Hanifa al-Nu'man, Imam Malik ibn Anas, Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi, Imam Ahmad ibn Hamad ibn Hanbal. May Allah have mercy on them all. But they were not the only scholars and imams of their era. There was Imam Thawri, there was Imam Abdullah ibn Barak, there was Al Awza'i, there was Sa'd ibn Layth, so many of them. So Islam is not exclusive to these four schools of thought. And this is why Allah spoke to us. And He said, whenever you dispute over an issue, refer it back to, the Qur to, to Allah and to the Rasul, the Prophet, meaning refer it back to Quran and Sunnah. Our methodology is that we are not infallible. We are human beings. Dr. Muhammad Salah, myself, any other da'i. We are not scholars. We are students of knowledge. Even real scholars of our times, like Sheikh bin Baz, bin Ithameen, uh, uh, and, and Sheikh Al-Albani, 
great scholars of Islam, they're not infallible, yet they have the real knowledge. You want to seek knowledge? Seek knowledge through such great scholars while cross-examining it with the Quran and Sunnah. Nowadays, we have new generation of da'is who have done a lot of good work, alhamdulillah, but unfortunately, they keep on camouflaging themselves, changing colors. Uh, um, I don't know why or how, but it's very difficult nowadays under the pressure of the media and of other uh, uh, sources, it's difficult to be steadfast, to continue to hold the torch of calling people to Quran and Sunnah with understanding of the Salaf, to continue holding the torch of avoiding violence and being rude or arrogant, to continue carrying the torch of educating people to love Allah, not to love me, not to love Tom, Dick or Harry, not to abide by we, what we say, but rather to abide by the Sharia laws. If you see people abide by this, follow them. And when you see people are deviated, go out of their path, insist it's either my way or the highway, and they are not complying with the Quran and the Sunnah, you should put question marks and raise flags and be careful. Because like Muhammad ibn Sirin said, may Allah have mercy on his soul, inna hadha al-ilm deen, this knowledge is religion. So you have to know who you're taking your religion from. You have to cross-examine people. So it is not one school of thought that we should follow. We respect all schools of thought. But if you are told that this is the hadith of the Prophet and you say, yes, but Imam so-and-so says otherwise, in this case, you're choosing to follow the Imam, not the Prophet And this is why Imam al-Shafi'i once narrated the hadith. And a man stood and said, okay, Imam Shafi'i, what do you say? And Imam Shafi'i was outraged. He said, do you see me wearing a, a cross? Do you see me wearing the belt of monks? I tell you the Prophet said so and so, and you say that, what is your opinion? Who has an opinion with the Prophet So I hope this, in a nutshell, answers your uh, uh, request, uh, my dear brother Muhammad Salah, and may Allah Azza wa reward you and make me and you uh, uh, steadfast on the straight path. I didn't get that, Akhi. Is it a call or a, a break? Okay, we have a short break. Stay, stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have Sister Hayat from Ethiopia. Hayat. All right, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, I have two questions for you. One is for myself and one is for my little sister. Okay. One is for myself and what is, one is for my little sister. Okay, your, your question please. Okay, my question is, uh, I wanted an explanation on istikhara prayer. Um, I made it for someone I wanted to marry, and the signs uh, showed that maybe it wasn't the best for me. But um, I, I haven't felt content about that uh, after I made the prayer. So how I should proceed following this, I would like your advice on that. Okay. And the second question is, my little sister has uh, problems when she makes her udu. She has um, was was and she keeps on making udu two, three times per sada, and she prays again and again. And um, we've tried uh, reciting the Quran for her and taking her to masjids 
to help her, but uh, it's been a very long time, almost three years now, and it's getting worse and worse by the day. Okay. So I was wondering if we could help her. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah, Hayat. Thank you very much. Jazakallah. Barakallah fiki. We have Amatullah from Egypt. Amatullah. Hello? Yes. Uh, uh, listen to me from the... Um, the TV and, and uh, well, actually, listen to me from your phone and mute your TV, yes. please. Okay, uh, one second, I'm sorry. Okay, you hear it now? Is that yeah, it? okay, mute your TV and go ahead. What's yes. your question? Yes. Um, well, I have a couple of questions, inshallah. Mm. Um, the first question is, um, is my husband committing fornication? He watches... Porn, uh, porn uh, videos. Okay. And the second one is, can I reject him in, in bed if he watches these videos or if he hits me? Can you watch? For any reason? Can you? Can I reject him? Can okay. I reject him in uh, intimacy? Okay. If if uh, he watches these videos or if we have a problem and he hits me. Okay. And also, am I committing uh, fornication myself? If I still have intimacy with him, if he doesn't pray, I'm... She doesn't pray? He doesn't pray at all? I don't really see him. I mean, he'll go to the sign once in a while. Your, your line is breaking, Amatullah. But um, you hear me now? Yeah. I said he, he prays, but not like I, like, not constantly like me, you know? Thank I mean, once in a while, he'll go to the, the mosque, sign under the fita in Cairo, where we live, and he'll pray. But he don't want to keep bringing up the situation. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Any more questions? Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, what was, uh, I have it listed. Wait, uh, am I? Yeah. How do you exactly say it? Because he didn't understand what I meant when I said dinner. I don't know if I'm saying it exactly the right way. To say what? Uh, fornication. Zina. Zina. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's what I told him. He, uh, what I meant. But uh, then if I have to, if I want to say if I want to divorce him, in the last three months, I still have to stay with him during those three cycles. Do I still have to take care of him? Okay. Or like even still like have intimacy with him? Okay. During, during those three months? Okay. Okay, well, that's it for now, for today. <laughs> okay, I'll answer you, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, thank you. So, Hayat from Ethiopia is asking about istikhara. One of the greatest misconceptions uh, 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 among people, among Muslims, is that when they pray istikhara, they anticipate a dream or a sign from Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is not related to istikhara. Istikhara is to make your due diligence, to investigate, to start firmly thinking that this opinion, this option is the best of all other options. So you opt for it, you select it. Now I pray istikhara, two rak'ahs, I make the dua, Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi'ilmik, I seek your choice through your knowledge and you say the dua and you move on you proceed now if there is good in it for you because you chose this and you went ahead with it after praying istikhara allah will facilitate it and will it happen if, and if there's nothing good in it for you allah would make it difficult and you'll be turned off and you'll choose something else so it is not a sign that you see or seek. It's not a dead cat that you find out your doorsteps or uh, a, a wedding that passes and makes everything happy for you and for your family. It is to go ahead with this marriage. If you did your due diligence, if you checked on the boy, he's righteous, he's practicing, his moral conduct is good, he has a good job, financially he's stable, his family is okay, you have a separate home of your own, you're not uh, to live with your in-laws, what more do you want? He's a good person, go ahead for it. What about this feeling that I'm having? What about this 
uh, 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 chest that I feel that it is getting tighter and tighter. This is from Shaitan. This is from Shaitan because this is a good proposal and you both will be or will do, uh, uh, become a good couple. But if there's something else that came up after istikhara, like the guy smokes or the guy um, is insincere or he flirts with women or he has rage fits or he's stingy, these are all part of the signs that may help you reject such a proposal in Allah Azza wa knows best. Her second question, Hayat says that her sister has an OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder in wudu and in praying. And she repeats the prayer over and over again, probably spends like an hour in the bathroom making wudu, then making another wudu and a third and a fourth. This type of OCD is quite common among the Muslims. And the reason is that shaitan is trying his level best to divert them from the straight path. So you are a good Muslim. You pray on time. This doesn't go down well the throat of shaitan. So what he comes up with, he analyzes your personality. If you are a person who is really easygoing, careless, neglectful, then he will tell you to delay a prayer and pray it with the second one or combine all prayers at the end of the day. If you wash half of your arm and you leave the other half, he comes to you and says, it's okay, move on. Allah is for most forgiving. And slowly he will make you abandon salat. If he finds after analyzing your personality and your character that you have strong iman and you're careful in performing things according to the sunnah and you're keen on taking religion with strength and power, he makes you exaggerate things. He makes you go overboard. So washing your limbs three times, no, this is for laymen. Making them five is best. Washing them seven times is best. I finish washing my body. No, oh, maybe you, you missed something. Just to be safe rather than sorry, do it over again. Tell you what, why not perform ghusl instead of wudu? This is even purer. And he keeps on doing this until he messes totally up with your mind. You pray. And just before the salam, he says, maybe you forgot a sajda. Maybe you mispronounced the fatiha. Tell you what, let's do it all over again. And he keeps on doing this until you reach the breaking point and you are in despair, you give up and you don't pray anymore. All of this is the handiwork of shaitan. This is the blue, blueprint of shaitan. And I see this every single day. I meet so many people with such OCD, an obsession about everything. And I can see how shaitan is messing up big time with their minds. May Allah Azza wa Jal cure them all. So, Shaykh, in a nutshell, what to do? Well, the first thing is you have to communicate. See, if a person is not convinced from inside that there is something wrong and that it needs help, then you cannot help those people. See, a lot of the people have BPD which is borderline personality disorder. And one of the characteristics of this disorder is that people don't think or believe that they're doing wrong or saying things that are wrong. If people are like this, how can you cure them? You need to have counseling sessions, a number of them to convince, to logic, and to bring them down to reality, then we, they will understand. So uh, Hayat, I believe you need to put your sister down speak to her in a number of sessions, telling her who is having a good time, who's laughing his head off when you make wudu more than once, when you spend in wudu more than four or five minutes. The only one who's laughing and having a good time is shaitan. So whenever someone comes and tells you, uh, your prayer is not valid, you might have missed something. Ask yourself, is this an angel? 
inspiring me and telling me to repeat that prayer because the angel loves me? Or is this shaitan messing up with my mind? And the answer would be definitely shaitan is messing with you, up with your mind big time and you have to avoid that and Allah Azza wa knows best. We have a caller, Hajj from Gambia. We have a caller. Hajj, mute your TV, please. Mute your TV totally and listen to me from the phone only. Okay, thank you. Yes, what can I do for you, Hajj? Um, actually, about the prayer, prayer style, you know, in, in our country here, Gambia, we have this misconception about prayer style. Okay. Uh, so the early hours of the prayers, uh -huh. some pray by that time. Okay. Some go for the second time. Okay. And who decides which is the first of the time and the end of the time? So normally those who pray first time, uh, we pray around one o'clock, the Gambian time here, or so many spas. Our Gambian time here. Yeah. Okay. So what so is it? So the, the second, the second hour that is two, two o'clock Gambian time here. Yeah. So many so minutes past two. Okay. So those playing by two sees that uh, those play the early hours of the time. Tai, I will answer your question. Any more questions? Okay, we've lost uh, Hajj, but I think he. Made this question clear. I will answer his question, inshallah. Amatullah from Egypt. Question number one. Her husband watches blue movies, pornography. So um, she says that she's hurt because of that. Is he committing fornication? The answer is no. This is not fornication nor adultery. It's a sin. And it is something that is prohibited. But it is neither pornography, uh, um, fornication nor adultery because that requires penetration and sexual intercourse and this is only the fornication of the eyes he's sinful and he'll be punished for that she says can i reject him okay you tell me uh, uh amatullah you have two options one to reject him and two not to reject him if you reject him what do you think would happen Usually, those who watch pornography would have to do something to relieve themselves from the tension and from the de desire they're getting. If they go to the halal means of doing so, and that is his spouse, and she rejects him, first of all, the angels curses her till morning. Regardless, you're not afraid of STDs. The guy is just watching, he's not doing. Secondly, you force him, you push him to look for fulfilling his sexual drive, sexual desire elsewhere, whether through a prostitute, a girlfriend, may Allah protect us, or through marrying a second wife. So the second option is the best option. And that is try to fulfill his sexual desire in a halal way. You are his wife. But not only that. Most likely, he did not watch pornography except because his iman is low and because you are not doing your job. If you were doing your job as a wife by taking good care of yourself, by exhausting him in the bedroom, so do it twice or three times a day if he has the power to do that. When you drain him totally, he wouldn't even look at the hijabi woman, let alone pornography. So you have to analyze and see what is happening so that you can fix it before it's too late. We have a caller. Musa from the Emirates. Musa. Naam, Sheikh. Hayyak Allah, akhi. What can I do for you? Naam, Sheikh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Zakallah. Naam, Sheikh. I have a question here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, how will I know that my business has reached the level of paying zakat al mali? How do what? How will I my business has come to the level of paying zakat al mali? 
Okay, what is your business? What is I'm your... just starting a small business, so I want to know if this business, it has a certain percentage that if you reach to such an amount of money, okay? Uh, yes, what, is, what kind of business? Do you sell products? Do you produce and manufacture? Do you uh, only provide services? I have a saloon. You have what, Akhi? A saloon, a saloon for hair cutting. Okay, okay. Okay, I will answer you, uh, your, your question. Any more uh, questions? Barakallahu feek. Amatullah's third question, uh, she says that if my husband does not pray frequently, he's not regular on his prayers, so would I be fornicating if I sleep with him? The answer is no. He's still a Muslim, though a sinful Muslim and in great danger. If he does not pray a single prayer and he's defiant, we tell him pray, he says, nope, I don't want to pray, I don't believe in praying. He, this guy is a kafir. You should immediately split and leave him and file for divorce. But if he's praying on and off, he's a Muslim, but he's a sinful Muslim, you need to approach him differently. And Amatullah, to tell you the truth, with uh, 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 a marriage such as yours, you do need to have counseling. You do need to know where you are going wrong because every person has a key to his heart. Some men have a key to their stomachs instead of their hearts. So it is your obligation to change your strategy. If your current strategy or your past strategy is not sufficient, is not efficient and it's not working this means that you need to change your strategy you cannot maintain the way you're dealing with your husband because it's not working out and inevitably you will resent him and he will not love you and then the marriage will break and this is something we do not want so you have to try to understand how he thinks try to listen from someone else if what you're doing is right or wrong and how to change your approach, then this might help, inshallah. Her last question was, if divorce takes place, and in the three months of the idda, waiting period, should I take care of him, and should I have intimacy with him? First of all, when a divorce takes place for the first or second time, the idda, or the waiting period, is generally speaking, three monthly cycles, and not three months of 90 days. Sometimes women can get three monthly cycles in two months. Her, she gets three menses in two months and sometimes in less than that. But the three months cycle uh, um, period, which is 90 days, this is for women who had reached the menopause or those who do not have menses to begin with. So for you, during this period, if this is the first or second divorce, you are still his wife. You take care of him, you adorn yourself, you wear your best of clothes and, and wear the best of perfumes, but there is no hanky-panky, what's, none whatsoever. No intimacy, no touching, no kissing, no hugging. Unless he says it clearly that he's revoking the divorce and reconciling with you. Other than that, it is not permissible to take care of him yes you're his wife you cook you clean you iron if he dies while you are in this idda period or waiting period you inherit him and if you die he inherits you so you're still man and wife with the exception of issues of intimacy uh, Hajj from Gambia or Al the Gambia he says that people pray in the beginning of the time and some people pray at the end of the time and he doesn't know what's happening. Akhi, you should know what's happening because this is part of the religion that you have no excuse not to know. See, in Islam, there are things that you must know as a Muslim. If someone says, Wallahi, I didn't know that prostrating to 
the statue of Buddha nullifies my Islam. This is tough bananas. This knowledge is not elective. This is mandatory. This is essential. It's part of your Islam. If someone says, I didn't know that five times uh, uh, we should pray. Well, Akhi, these are the pillars of Islam. You have to know. So there is this knowledge that each and every individual is not exempted from not knowing. You must know. But there are these types of knowledge, knowledge that are uh, um, optional. So someone who does not sell and buy, he doesn't need to know what is the bay'ul uh, gharar, the ambiguous transactions, the different kinds of ina or uh, uh, the different types of riba, etc. Because he doesn't have money to buy and sell. We don't say, yes, you don't have money, but you must tell me what the rulings are. No. So for you, as a Muslim, you need to know that each one of the five daily prayers has a beginning of the time and has an end to each time. In between, you are allowed and permitted to pray. And if you pray at the beginning, this is good. And if you pray in the middle, this is oh, good. And if you pray at the very end, this is permissible, but maybe good, maybe not, depending on the salat. So once you learn this piece of information, and it doesn't take you more than three to five minutes to learn it, then you will find things to be easy, inshallah. We have a caller. Ali from Germany. Ali. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. V Gates. I have a question. And uh, um, I'm living in Germany. And actually, if you know, in Europe, not just in Germany, we do have something called hospital. Uh, called what? Money from the government. Social money. Social money. I don't understand. The social money that you can get every month from money from the government. Ah, Even okay. If you are not working. Benefits, you mean? Benefits and social uh, security? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my question okay. now is, if you are here and we are not working and we, we are able to work, I mean, we have this health to go and work, but we still getting this benefit from the government, is that halal or haram? Okay. Any more questions? No, that's all. Okay. Hasib from Bangladesh. <coughs> Hasib, bye. Salam to Allah. Hasib. Hear me? Um, very, very uh, hypnotizing. Do you hear me? Yes, your voice is hypnotizing, Yahi. Have some energy. Yes, Hasib. I can't hear you, sir. Okay, I think we have a problem. Let Hasib yeah. call, inshallah, later on. Barakallah. Type. Um, I can't hear, I can't even read my handwriting. I think Musa from the Emirates, he's asking about zakat and how to know what is the threshold of the zakat and how to pay money over his business and this is frequently asked question and unfortunately people do not realize that not every business requires zakat so for example i have a million dollars i wish and i make a company or an establishment that is totally uh, owned by me and I furnish the building, I rent a building, I get employees to work in my building, and every year there's no zakat on it. What about the million dollars, Sheikh? Well, the million dollars were invested in the premises, in the furniture, in the cars, and in the telephone line, the lease line, etc., the computers. But the essence or the work of this company is consultation. So people call in and say, we have a business, we need a consultant to come and uh, make a, a, a road map for us on how to progress in our business. So my uh, employee goes and sits with them for a couple of weeks, puts a road map and a strategy, a mission, a vision, blah, 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 and they pay him an amount of money. I take the amount of money 
and I expand and spend it. At the end of the year, I don't have savings. I don't have fixed assets that is uh, 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 that are sold and bought. So I, I'm not a, a merchant. I'm not a trader. I give services. I give consultations. There's no zakat in it. Those who have a factory or uh, that is a hundred million dollars worth of machinery and uh, property and etc. What is zakatable is what is produced. So if we produce and in the warehouse we have goods worth of a million, then this million is zakatable, but not the other 99 million of the premises and the machinery, etc. For a person who has a saloon, I'm assuming that the work is halal, meaning that it is a saloon for men. It's a barber's shop. So they only cut hair and they uh, uh, do haircuts that are halal. They don't shave the beard. They don't pluck the eyebrows, etc. This is permissible. There is no zakat. The chair, the hair dryers, the jill, the blades, whatever, there's no zakat on that. The zakat is on your revenue. So after one year of collecting profit and money, we look at the money in the bank account. If it is more than, let's say, 300 or 400 dollars, the value of 595 grams of silver, then you give 2.5% every year on that particular day. And Allah Azza wa knows best. We have a caller, Ibrahim from Gambia. Yes. Yes, Ibrahim. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, I'm calling from the Gambia. Uh, somebody called um, a moment ago, calling uh, from the Gambia to ask him about the time of yes. the prayer. Yes. Yes, he's, he's right. We do have conflicting time, praying time in the Gambia here. Okay, explain. Yes, what I want to know is, you know, we are, we are all Muslim and we pray, all pray to, to the same God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Correct. Yes, does that mean that we should pray, you know, we and every country has its own time? Give example, yeah, Ibrahim. Yes, yes, we, whether should we should be praying with Saudi Arabia at the same time or should we pray in our own time too? Ah. Because we, when we watch Saudi TV, there, there are times that they display on their, on their screen below. Okay. Yes, and tell us, it tell every country the time that exactly they should pray with Saudi Arabia. So, but we don't usually follow that here. We only pray on two o'clock, some others pray half, half past one, and others pray ten past two. So what I'm asking, is it right to pray with Saudi Arabia, or should we still follow the praying time that we usually pray here in the Gambia? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Okay, okay, Musa... Um We've answered his question. Ali from uh, Germany, he says, and this is a big problem, Ali, a lot of the immigrants who go to Germany, to uh, UK, to Finland, and I don't need to mention which continent, but they are well known. The moment they go in, they do not work. Some of them even tear their passports and apply for asylum. And they sit there, they take benefits for unemployment from the government and unfortunately cheat and lie and deceit the government that's paying them because it's a Kafir government and they work without declaring that they have a job. They take their wages in cash so they don't have to register that and be deprived of uh, uh, unemployment and they're married and they register themselves as single or even single parent. A Muslim does not do this and such people are the worst representation of Islam. Such people tarnish the reputation of Islam and the Muslims. In a sense they are professional beggars. They extend their lower hand and Allah tells us that the upper hand is better than the lower hand. They have the audacity to go and say, yes, give us money. This is our right. It's not your right. You are just a liar and a cheater. Yes, if you're looking for a suitable job and you do 
your best to work in a halal job and you're unable to find one, meanwhile the government is giving you money, there's no problem. But if the government says this is a job for you and you go and you flunk it deliberately and then they give you another job and you decline because physically you're not fit, so you claim. And you go for a third and a fourth and you continue to live in their houses, to take their benefits while doing nothing, this is definitely haram and you are sinful. Now, Ibrahim from the Gambia, I don't know if we have enough time for this, but I'll do my best. Akhi, you are in a different country. Your sunrise and sunset are different to the sunrise and sunset of mine when I'm in Saudi Arabia. So you can't follow the timings of prayer in Saudi Arabia because in Islam, each one of us Muslims, 1.8 billion, our prayer time is dependent on our location. So if I'm here in Cairo, Egypt, or tomorrow if I'm in the uh, uh, Emirates in Dubai, or if I'm in, in LA, Los Angeles, in California, the time of prayer is dedicated or dictated by the position of the sun. So Jibreel, peace be upon him, came to the Prophet ﷺ when he was in Mecca and he prayed two days leading the, prayer in, uh, leading the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in prayer. In the first day, he prayed as soon as the dawn broke. So when the break of dawn, when the horizontal line of true Fajr appears, he started praying Fajr. The following day, he waited, waited, waited until the sun was about to rise. It did not rise yet. The whole sky was lit, but the sun ring itself did not rise. And he prayed it then. And he told the Prophet Islam that prayer of Fajr is between these two times, which is approximately an hour plus, which means that if you pray in the beginning of time, middle of time, end of time, it's okay. Dhuhr time, he prayed when the sun was off its zenith. So the sun rises, 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 and if you have an erect object, the shadow of it re is reduced in size until the sun becomes in the middle of the sky and the erect object has no shade. Once it goes a little bit to the west and the erected object has a shadow to the east, this is the time of Dhuhr. And this time extends for about two to three hours until the shade of an erect object is equal to it. Once the shade is equal to the erect object, then this is the time of Asr. The time of Dhuhr is over. So this, these three hours is okay for you to pray Dhuhr in the beginning, which is 12.30 or 1.30 or 2.30 or even 3.15, depending when the time is over. Asr, from this time until the sun sets. Maghrib is from the sunset until the redness of the zenith at uh, uh, the west disappears, so there's no redness in the horizon. Isha, from that disappearance time until the middle of the night, and this, these are the times of prayer that you have flexibility in praying, whether in the beginning, middle, or the end. I'm afraid that we have to wrap it up and to end our episode, so until we meet next time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech.